Good afternoon, audience. And first of all, to open, I would like you all to close your eyes. Yes, that means you in 36B. You have to do it as well. <laughs> now, imagine your breakfast table as it was when you ate on it this morning. Now, I would like you to assess this image using three criteria. Brightness, definition, and color. What's the illumination in the room like? Are there any reflections of sorts? Is it comparable to that of real life? Is there a shifting focus point that moves around only when you pay attention to a specific object? Or does the entire image stay in the same focus? Does the food look edible, washed out, faded, black and white even? Audience, please open your eyes and observe this statistic. Out of this crowd of 100 or so people, three or four of you will be experiencing dim or completely absent visual capabilities. Hello, my name is Victoria Butler, and today I'm here to give a speech on the importance of researching aphantasia in cognitive science. Now, what is cognitive science? Cognitive science is the study of the brain and its behaviors. Aphantasia is the lack of ability to, let's say, visualize images in the brain. Now, when a typical visualizer will think of something, an image might procure itself into their head, but a total aphant will not see anything. Aphids usually like to think in concepts or words. Now, the opposite of this, hyperphantasia, thinking in extremely lifelike, extremely well-detailed images. Although not as common as aphantasia, it does happen. Now, what I've opened with today is taken from the 1800s breakfast study by Francis Galton. This study was aiming to capture the audience and diagnose the spectrum of visuals. And yet, for hundreds and hundreds of years, this has still remained unstudied. Heck, even the term aphantasia was only coined recently in 2015 by researcher Adam Zeman. So why, if maybe one in every 20 people in your workplace, your school, are affected by this, then why does nobody study it? Today, I'm here to try and spread awareness and teach others on maybe what other people think, how the inner workings of each other's brains work, and hopefully open your minds. Now, before we can take a look at aphantasia, let's take a look at a related function, memory. Now, memory and aphantasia use very similar parts of the brain. For starters, even, aphantasia relies solely on visualization, sorry, visualization relies solely on memory to collage itself in the first place. For example, let's say you want to imagine a top hat. For many of you, just my phrase, imagine a top hat, has caused you to procure one into your mind. How did that happen? You see, when you take in raw visual information through your eyes, it's almost like you're ordering a package online from a mysterious seller and it's getting delivered. When you take that image in through your mind, then it goes to the LGN, or lateral geniculate nucleus, of your thalamus, or what can be said as, in layman's terms, the mailman of your brain. The mailman might take your package inside the building and deliver it to the right location, similarly to how your LGN might. Now, I know a lot of you in the audience may not be fans of scientific terminology or scientific workings, but please bear with me here. From your LGN, it goes to the V1 of your visual cortex, which can be described as sort of the central building of visual affairs in our little office simulation. Now, in the visual cortex, it'll be split up and sent to two different lobes, the occipital and parietal lobe. It is the job of these lobes to dissect the information and make use of it, sort of similarly to how a team might use to make use of that product you ordered. Now, it is thanks to the parietal lobe that you can distinguish between objects and use the information as knowledge. Thanks to all of these parts working together, your brain can process images in as little as 13 milliseconds, storing it successfully into your long and short-term memory. Speaking of long-term memories, those are stored in the cerebral cortex. But what relies more importantly is synapses, or the connections between neurons in your brain. How information travels at all is through synapses, and you can strengthen these by using the same ones over and over. Say, for example, you are trying to learn a new skill or play a piece on the piano. At first, you try and put your hands on the keys, but your, your fingers can't find the right places, and you forget what note is next, and you're not very good. 
But as the saying goes, practice makes perfect. And after a week of you keeping at it, you have a nice piano piece. You have muscle memory, so to speak. And it sounds great. It's your fingers know where to go. And it's all thanks to the synapses being strengthened through repetitive use. Now that we've taken a look at memory, why don't we take a closer look at the condition itself, aphantasia. Although not much research is present about the inner workings of aphantasia in the brain, what we can find is some interesting conclusions based on case studies. For example, one from the Journal of Scientific Studies by Rafael dos Santos shows an interesting case of a non-congenital aphant, somebody who hasn't had it since birth, but instead developed it through a tough period or just a long time in their life. Now, this Evan's name, er, alias, goes by S.E., and he describes some peculiarities in his mind after taking DMT, or NN-dimethyltryptamine. After ingesting DMT, despite being previously totally aphantasic, S.E. reported an increase in visualization, now being able to visualize small images, and especially around nighttime, visualize nice pictures. Now, this is interesting, because previously, this man was no better able to see than just completely black. But now he's able to unlock that portion of his brain. This could provide an interesting thesis that non-congenital aphantasia is sources from an inability to access the per, uh, pineal gland in the brain, which produces these sort of chemicals in a minute scale. This would explain why, although SE was able to visualize at a young age, he eventually lost the ability and regained it again. Now, before I continue with the second case study, uh, I find it important to mention that DMT and LSD, which I will shortly talk about, are both highly illegal and dangerous drugs. On the market today, they are very addictive and unsafe for normal consumption. Finding a medicinal and prescription use for this could either reclaim or worsen the situation regarding this, which is why I suggest if drug therapy does provide to be a suitable option, that we keep it secluded in market and not in prescriptions. Now, onto the second case study. Shortly after this first one was published, a reply article cropped up, outlining a similar but importantly different case. A congenital aphant, somebody who's had this condition since they were born, took another psychedelic drug, namely LSD, and although never experiencing any visual effects, it was quite apparent to the researcher who was present that he was experiencing the mental, physiological, and hearing stimuli. What these two cases could present together is that not only do congenital anaphantasia show some important differences in the brain, that they may even be presenting as different conditions at all. They only seem like the same from the outside, but on the inside, the brain functions are completely different. Now, although we still do not know much about the brain conditions of aphids, a condition we do know a little bit more about is schizophrenia. Now, I'm sure many of you have heard about this condition and the stigmas around it, but a few of negative effects include abnormal activities in voxel parts of the brain, abnormal activities of gray matter, and 16 to 72% of schizophrenic patients reporting visual hallucinations of some kind. Now, visual hallucinations can be dangerous and even potentially lethal to the schizophrenic patient and people around them, and there's no currently known cure. However, there is something seems to be broadening on the horizon. Aphantasia has been proven and studied to be a buffer against anomalous percepts and seems to resist external hallucination probes like the Gans flicker effect, which is a video that usually induces hallucinations within 10 seconds. If aphantasia can be gained through life, why wouldn't it be possible to put it into a lab and purposely instill aphantasia into someone's mind? We can use this as sort of a experimental cure, experimental medicine to treat these hallucinations and help the well-being of many people in addition to furthering research in this field. Now, although aphantasia research is still many unfounded, I hope my speech today has left you with a sense of wonder, a sense of curiosity, and at the very least, the widening of your horizons in relation to how other people around you think. Might I remind you again, one in every 20 people will be experiencing some form of low or absent visualization. So in your life, you can think of family, friends, school. People think completely different to you, and yet this condition is very little known about. I hope maybe I've inspired somebody, well, somebody in this room, to go out and become a researcher in this field, further this medicine. But if not, 
I hope you take this with you. Recognize what others are like and recognize your differences. Together, we can further medicine. Thank you.